Welcome to our service from the Unitarian Society of Northampton, Florence. I'm Craig Dreesen, a member of the Stewardship Committee. It's wonderful to see you here, both in the Great Hall and online. And thank you for all the folks who are making this service possible. If you're new or returning after time away, we're very glad you're here. Feel free to fill out a blue card, welcome card, or there's a similar thing on the chat that put it, you can put that in the offering plate and we will keep in touch with you about our activities. We strive to be a congregation that welcomes people of all ages, races, religious beliefs, backgrounds, sexual orientations, gender identities, and abilities. We belong to the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, and we are guided and inspired by its values and principles. Our values and principles move us to remember that in Northampton, we inhabit unceded land of the Pukubtuk and Nipmunk peoples. They remind us to acknowledge our responsibility to face the legacies of dispossession and systemic, systemic racism that are part of our collective history, even as we affirm and celebrate the legacies that inspire us. We're here to re celebrate, to reflect, and to support one another in sustaining hope and up upholding our values. If you're on Zoom, we ask that you please keep your videos off, except during the greeting, and in the Great Hall, we thank you for wearing your mask. Today, we open our annual stewardship campaign, hence the uh, bow ties of many of the stewardship committee members. Um, the, at this, during this campaign, we invite everyone to reflect on what is important to us and uh, what, that what we do here matters. As we do each year, a third of us will get a uh, call from a volunteer steward inviting to have a conversation about what you care about and to invite your pledge. And the rest of us will get a uh, letter in the mail and a pledge card and we'll ask you to respond to that letter. So I just want to invite the uh, stewards, who, if you're here in the hall, to stand up so we can just see who you are. If you're at home, you can't tell, these are really friendly people and you're gonna to wanna to have a conversation with them. So thank you for that. Every gift matters and uh, helps sustain this congregation. We thank you. Uh, two more announcements. At 11.15 today, we're gonna to have a discussion about Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Raise an Anti-Racist for Anyone with Children in Your Lives. You're welcome to attend even if you haven't read the book. Um, you'll meet in the parlor and lunch will be provided. And then from 2 to 4 p.m. today, you're invited to join the Klimzaks for a skating party. You reach out to Corky or David or Jessica for directions. Corky, are you here? Yeah, there, look, there's Corky. And now we'll begin our service. <laughs>
Don't leave your broken heart at the door. Don't leave your anger behind either. It has high standards and the world needs vision. Bring them with you and your joy. Bring your need for healing and your power to heal. There is work to do and you have everything you need here to do it. I invite you now to rise in body or spirit and join in saying the words to accompany lighting our chalice. <laughs> our chalice lighter forgot his job. We light our chalice this morning, grateful for the love we experience in this beloved community. May its flame light the way for all who seek such abundance. And now please remain standing and sing. morning. Our story today is called Joseph Had a Little Overcoat by Sims to Back. And for the elementary students that are here, we're going to take a page out of Joseph's book. So see what he does. And we're going to use his ideas to do some upcycling when we go downstairs. Joseph Had a Little Overcoat. Joseph Had a Little Overcoat. It got old and worn what he did. So he made a jacket out of it and went to the fair. And something you can't see on these slides is that the book shows a little bit about how creative he was. There's a hole. So he has his jacket. Joseph had a little jacket, but it got old and worn. So he made a vest out of it and danced at his nephew's wedding. Joseph had a little vest. It got old and worn. Any guesses what he might have made out of it? He made a scarf out of it and sang in the men's chorus, or maybe the USNF choir. Joseph had a little scarf. It got old and worn. Any guesses what it might have become next? I think I heard a tie, let's see. So he made a necktie out of it and went to visit his married sister in the city. Joseph had a little necktie. It got old and worn. So what could he have made out of it? Oh, a hanky. So he made a handkerchief out of it and drank a glass of hot tea with lemon. Joseph had a little handkerchief. It got old and worn. What could he have made with that small handkerchief? A bow tie, and he was part of the stewardship committee. No, let's see. So he made a button out of it and used it to fasten his suspenders. But Joseph had a little button, and one day he lost it. Don't worry, the story doesn't have a sad ending. Now he had nothing, but let's see what he did. So Joseph made a book about it, which shows you can always make something out of nothing. Please rise now in body or spirit and join in singing hymn number 360, Here We Have Gathered.
And now it's time to greet one another. Oh, you have to stand up again. <laughs> you can turn and wave to everyone on Zoom, and Jessica will show you who they are. Hello, everyone on Zoom. Hi, Laurie and Molly, who I didn't get time to say hello to. Hello, Kit. Hi. Sally, good to see you. Katie, good to see you. Hi again, Laurie and Joanna. Jean, nice to see you. Georgia, Jane, oh my goodness. Nancy, it's good to see you. Hey, Ed and Lou. Hey, Jan. Peggy Mish, great to see you. William, Carl and Kim, hello. Hey, Rick. Hi, Gail. Hi, Steve and Teresa. See who else is there. That's Nancy again. Paula and Wally. Peg, great to see you. And hi, Laura and Larry. Who else is there? Gail and John. Great to know you're here. Hello, Mr. Hayes and Mary. So nice to have you here this morning. Now it's time for everyone who is on Zoom to turn their videos off again and for everyone in the hall who is going to religious education activities to leave us and we will sing you out. Good morning. Glad we all made it through that little chill session. Uh, good to see so many people here. This morning, I want to review the progress on our efforts to reduce meat, meat <coughs> consumption as a means of reducing the damage to the environment generated through raising beef, poultry, hogs, and lamb. Can I take this off? Yes, you can. Sure. Yes, please. Thank you. So as a way to um, improve the health of the people and to do so sustainably. I was optimistic that I could find data supporting the reduction because it seemed to me that so many of us are trying to reduce our meat consumptions. I absolutely know that this is true within our congregation, but I did not keep in mind that we here in the Valley live in a bubble. And when I looked at the data from the Department of Agriculture published in April of 2022, <clears throat> excuse me, the report focused on the growth of meat consumption over the past 10 years throughout the United States. However, at the end of the report, the Department of Agriculture said in fine print, we are anticipating a modest decrease in meat consumption in 2022. And I thought if that is changing the direction of this giant ship, that's really good news. While this decrease may be due in part to inflation with the surge in interest in making more vegetarian or vegan meals, my hope is that people will look at these options as better than eating meat, which indeed they are. 
in an effort to keep eating less meat front and center in people's minds, CAG produced some simple bumper stickers which are found, which will be found on the table in the back of the church. This is what they look like. Can you see that all right? Okay. Though many of us may be hesitant to display bumper stickers for a variety of reasons, they are an opportunity to raise awareness. However, these particular bumper stickers are not water repellent, and so we recommend that you don't put them on your bumper because <laughs> they just pretty much dissolve, but that you tape it to the inside of your window, one of the windows, preferably not your front window. Um, these stickers represent our first effort toward spreading the word, but they are far from perfect. So if we have any artists or designers or aspiring advertising personnel in the congregation who would like to offer alternative designs, we are open to that offering. Thank you in advance for your suggestions and offerings. Thank you, Fran. We embrace imperfection here. And our generosity makes everything we do possible. Half of the proceeds of each week's Sunday offering support the society's operating budget and the other half is shared outside our walls. And tomorrow night, the coordinating council will be choosing the organizations that will support between now and the end of this year. So, so through August. So everyone is welcome to come. Anyone who comes can vote. Um, and you can email, you can either email Jessica at dre at uunorthampton.org or you can email Steve um, or uh, Lori, Steve Kramer or Lori Loisel, and that email is council at uunorthampton.org. And um, if you, we, they, we can still take suggestions. You can ma and uh, for this morning, you can mail in a check, you can donate online, or you can put your contribution in one of the plates that the ushers will pass. Our offering will now be given and very gratefully received.
Let me tell you, let me ask you to unmute it, just to hear it. Okay. Good morning. I'm Susie McRae, and I've been part of this congregation since my husband Eric and I moved to Northampton in 2019. The last time I gave a stewardship testimonial was in our old UU congregation. And at that time, I focused on what the church meant for our family. I reflected on how we chose to spend our money and how one of the most important gifts we were giving our children was to be part of a thriving UU community. It wasn't summer camps, piano lessons, or restaurant dinners. Now fast forward 10 years or so, it is no longer about our kids. We have chosen to invest in our congregations for many reasons, but the main one is that we recognize the importance, not only to us, but, the, but to the larger community. I have been known to say, if only more people could be you use, the world would be a better place. I don't mean to be self-righteous, I love this faith, and I hope you understand the spirit of what I mean. Every Friday, the Sunday Times appears in our inboxes with the following words on top, where we are inspired to better the world. When I first thought about serving on the stewardship committee, my reaction was, I'd rather be doing actions to better the world than helping to raise money. But I know that having the congregation in a strong place financially is important. It helps, helps us be able collectively to do things to better the world. So now I do both. And doing these with people from USNF makes my heart sing. That's partly because here we are inspired to support each other in living our values. And we understand and respect that each of us does that in our own ways. Some of us are raising children or living our values through the paid work we do or volunteering at other organizations in our spare time. I especially value the work that I do with members of this congregation. I've learned so much from others through USNF The Vote, and I appreciate that we lift each other up when our candles start to dim. I also appreciate the support from the congregation, our minister, and the staff who make the work possible. Eric and I are so happy to have USNF as our new spiritual home, and we will continue to make our fair share contribution. According to the Heart Guide, which I think most of you are familiar with, fair share pledging means giving generously according to our commitment and to our means. One thing I really like about this community is that we make an effort to be inclusive and we recognize that we don't always succeed and then we try to do better. As a member of the stewardship team, I want to encourage everyone to join in and give whatever you can. We are all part of this wonderful whole. Thank you. Today's meditation comes from something that was written by Alice Walker. Love, if it is love, never goes away. It is embedded in us like seams of gold in the earth, waiting for light, waiting to be struck. be together in the silence.
This reading comes from something written by Leslie Takahashi, who is a UU minister in California and who has served both the UU Ministers Association and the Unitarian Universalist Association in numerous ways. She's a fabulous leader and a great person. She writes, this community offers many gifts. The opportunity to be affirmed in who we are and to offer that affirmation to others. The chance to work together to help remake the world in the ideal of justice. The reminder that we must see our world through the lens of love. These are gifts paid for with many currencies the courage of those who persist in the name of justice, the questions of our children as they try to understand the world and then offer us fresh ways of seeing, the dollars and cents of those who give what they can, and the infinite acts of service, large and small, that make the parts greater than the whole. May we receive all of these gifts with gratitude and humility. And now I invite you to rise in body or spirit to sing hymn number 404, What Gift Can We Bring? Love, in Alice Walker's words, is embedded in us. So I have a story that I told once before over a decade again, and if you remember it, then you have a very good memory. So I graduated with a master's degree in management in 1980. And right after that, I took a job with Coopers and Librand, which was at that time one of the big eight accounting firms. My starting salary was $24,000 a year, which was about 140% increase over what I had earned before I got my degree. We bought a small condo for $49,000 in the Boston neighborhood of Jamaica Plain, and I moved in to start my new job downtown while my husband Booker finished his last year of medical residency in New Haven. I was 27. And writing that monthly mortgage check felt like a rite of passage. But I wrote another monthly check that represented something much more important. So both of my mother's parents were still alive at that point, and they lived on my grandfather's social security and his very small teacher's pension. 
My grandmother's mind and body had begun to fail several years earlier and it got to the point where he couldn't take care of her and she was now in a nursing home. And I knew that my grandfather worried about the dwindling balance of their savings and about his ongoing ability to pay the bill. And that new salary felt bountiful. Even after the mortgage was paid, Booker's residency stipend covered his living expenses, so I offered to help my grandfather with the nursing home costs. And I don't remember how much I gave him. I do remember how good it felt to write and mail him that check. It was my way of saying thank you for the act of love and support they had always given me. And after I met Booker had given both of us. I still feel blessed and grateful. And so writing that check was something I did in the name of love. So you might want to think about that. Those of you who have been doing this for a while, when you make your annual stewardship commitment, or when you write the checks or set the amount the bank will send to the society's bank account, how do you feel? Do you take time to feel? I bet you feel responsible. Making a pledge commitment is a responsibility of membership for every member who can afford to contribute something. We don't require it. It is not a requirement of membership for people who can't. Non-members make contributions and commitments as well. Again, they may feel responsible for helping to pay for something that they value and use. And that's a great thing. But when we go a little deeper, I believe we make those gifts for the same reason that I helped my grandparents all those many years ago. We make them because we are grateful, because the community matters to us. We make them in the name of love. So in this congregation, the vast majority of our income it's, um, it's 80%, if you count what we give to the plate and other donations, comes from contributions received from our members and our friends. And we also draw modestly on invested funds. In last year's budget, that was about 12% of our income. Building rental fees provide a little bit, but as you know, the pandemic knocked out build, building rental fees and many meetings and events that used to happen in physical space now aren't happening at all, or they happen on Zoom. And the AA meeting the, that we still support and that um, used to pay us $400 a month, it's dwindled. It's very sadly, it has really dwindled. And we ask them to pay what they can because it's an important thing that we do for the community to host that meeting. And also, for those of you who are new, you should know that our UU Association does not provide us with financial support. It works the other way around. <laughs> we make a contribution. And it's money well spent, but we make a contribution to support them, and that's about $23,000 a year. So I was talking with Jessica this week in preparing for this service about what had happened in the past year during 2022. And we agreed there's kind of this COVID fog over everyone that makes it hard to remember. So I said to her, you had a baby in January. <laughs> and she remembered that. <laughs> Jessica took parental leave through most of March and members of the RE Council stepped in to help. It went pretty much without a hitch. We have a wonderful early childhood teacher, Emma Godro. And um, Ruby Cools was our Mount Holyoke student. She's now a grad living out Midwest somewhere. They ran the RE programming along with the RE Council in Jessica's absence. I do think Jessica came back, or at least partially back, a little sooner than she might have wanted to. And that turns out that that was because I had a two month sabbatical in March and April, which I had forgotten about. <laughs> Mem members of the worship committee worked hard to organize, I know you haven't forgotten. Members of the worship committee, I know they haven't forgotten. They worked hard to organize and coordinate two months of services, um, many of them led by one or more of you. 
So what else has happened? Despite the gremlins who do play tricks with us some Sundays, this past year we have gotten comfortable offering services and programs simultaneously in person and online. Our committee and team meetings have largely continued on Zoom and we've embraced the blessings of that mode of doing things. It saves people's time, it reduces our collective carbon footprint, and most importantly, it allows us to invite people who live at a distance to participate and share their gifts and talents with us. And we are blessed to have those people able to share their gifts and talents with us. Our climate action group, as Fran illustrated this morning, continues to inspire us with ways to make changes that will reduce the harm we cause individually while also championing climate legislation and engaging in political actions. The racial justice team, as you heard last week, has galvanized us to look at ways to commit to building beloved community. And our USNF, the vote team that Susie mentioned, has engaged 100 and 150 of us at least in writing postcards, making phone calls, educating ourselves and others about the perils our democracy faces. We have cooked for the homeless. We've sold books to support health care in Haiti. Together this past year, we have mourned our losses. We have shared our stories and our wonderings. We have enjoyed one another. We've made art. We've played games at Arcadia in August again in September, at our Friday art gatherings for Arts Night Out. We have welcomed many new families to religious education and new people to our pews and to our screens. And we are very, very glad that you have found us and hope that you will want to stay. Our staff have continued to serve us with commitment and grace. They are Frank Talon, our custodian, Emma Godreau, who I, who I mentioned, our early childhood teacher, Kali Williams, who's our coordinator of youth and young adult programs. Ellen Kogan, our wonderful music director. Michael Taylor, manager of congregational operations. Jessica Harwood, our director of faith formation and community engagement. And we have Eva Wigan Whittier, who is a Smith student who grew up in this congregation. She's our elementary teacher. You see Emma sitting in front. She walks out with the kids. And then Ian Barnhart and Jessica Quintana, Jessica Quintana, who are both members of our youth group, also help Emma in the early childhood room. So now, February is the time that we look ahead and plan for the fiscal year that begins in September of 2023. We have a little bit of a weird fiscal year. And that year, so our fiscal year runs from the beginning of September to the end of August. And this is the time where we ask for commitments for the next year. We plan ahead because it feels like the right and prudent thing to do. And we really don't want to guess when we make decisions about salaries for the new year. Compensation and benefits for staff and minister make up three quarters of our budget. That's a lot. So we invented a giving guide that I think Susie referred to. We call it the hearts guide. And they're, they're hearts that co correspond to different levels of giving. If you are on the schedule to get a visit from a stewardship volunteer this year, you, ha you don't have one yet. If you aren't, but you have pledged before, you'll get one of these in the mail this week. And if you're new and would like to just look at it, we have them up here and you can, um, Craig, Dreesen and Susie McRae will come up here after the service and just have them here and they can give you one if you're interested. But if, you're, but if you've pledged before, don't take one because you'll be getting one in the mail. We give at different reasons. We give for different, at different levels. And one of those is our level of involvement. And another reason is how much we can afford. And for some of us, 2022 has been a hard year financially. There were no more government COVID subsidies, costs for the basics of gas, groceries, utilities, rent. Those have all gone up. 
People living on retirement savings have seen a big drop in the monetary value of those savings because after a few years of kind of crazy double digit gains in the stock market, the losses may feel especially worrisome. And for some of us, they may have had a real impact on the amount we are or feel able to spend on things that are not essentials. So I also want to say that some of you are very new and we don't expect that you necessarily know that you plan to make this congregation your home for the foreseeable future. We do welcome your gifts. We welcome a pledge if you think this is the congregation that you want to support for the foreseeable future. But please, please don't feel it as an obligation or, or an expectation. We also know that some of you who are members or who have been giving are giving as much as you can. Some of you may be saving to buy a first home, stretching to pay that mortgage, have been hurt by a drop in retirement savings, or have other calls on your resources. We are a diverse community when it comes to our backgrounds, our ages, and our financial means. And that diversity is a very good thing. We are enriched by our diversity. And we're grateful for every gift of every size because we all give to the society in the spirit of gratitude, in recognition of the responsibility for our religious community, and we give in the name of love. And some of us could give more. This year, we might try to simply keep up with inflation. We hope we'll keep up with inflation so that we can give some raises to the staff and we can keep on doing pretty much what we do. But I'm just gonna suggest for a minute that we could also dream. If we dream, we might open, the possi open possibilities that we could expand our vision of what we can do and be. So one of the things I was thinking about was that at the end of this month, the USNF, the vote and racial justice teams together, they're co-sponsoring conversations about the book, One Person, No Vote, which is a very sobering and I hope ultimately maybe galvanizing look at the history and the present state of voter suppression and disenfranchisement aimed specifically at black and other minority communities. That is deeply, deeply ingrained in our history. We have reached out to other faith communities in town and to Northampton's Indivisible group. Also, um, we've publicized it. We've asked the Sojourner Truth School to publicize our um, book discussion. So we're inviting people from those other groups to join us. And the reason we can do that the reason we're able to handle group conversations if we happen to attract a crowd is because many of you have become so skilled at facilitating conversations. We have become good at group conversations that encourage open sharing and that allow people to look at and express what's on their hearts as well as on their minds. And we learned pretty well how to manage them both in person and on Zoom. So think about that and dream for a moment about what we might be able to do with that learning and skill, which we have as a foundation. Imagine how we might broaden our reach to others who share our values and passions, but don't even know we exist. We have a new social media team. Jess Jones, Margot Lenoy, Ty Power, and Jessica Harwood have joined up to form that team. What opportunities might what they're doing open up? Maybe we would want to become a Western Massachusetts beacon for Unitarian Universalism, perhaps a resource for some of the very small churches north and west of us that are still hanging on by their fingernails through offering programs, our programs more widely. Or, and we've talked about this, imagine that we really find ways to meaningfully engage in, with groups in Holyoke or Springfield around climate, around housing, around critical issues that they and we face. Those are just glimmers of ideas. They're possible possibilities. I'm sure, I hope, you all might have others. 
So Sims Tabak, who's the author of today's story, which is an old Yiddish folktale, of course, says the moral of his version of the story of Joseph's overcoat is, you can make something from nothing. But Joseph doesn't make that story from nothing. He makes it out of his experience and his creativity and his imagination, and he uses paper and paint and a pen. And I am sure of this. It would be very challenging for us to implement anything else meaningful, really meaningful and sustainable using volunteers alone. So we'd need hope and support to broaden our reach in some of those ways. We'd need to devote resources toward, I think, paid staffing for help and support. So you might have other ideas, as I said, other dreams, and maybe the time and energy to spend time developing them. That part would need to come from all of you. I also hope this is something else that probably most of you don't know about, but I'm hoping we'll have the opportunity to collaborate with other congregations in Northampton on a program to provide weekend meals for children who are currently receiving free school lunches during the week. I think there are somewhere between 800 and 1,000, it's, it's a mind boggling number, between 800 and 1,000 families that are eligible and are suffering from um, food shortage right here in our community. This has been identified as a critical need across the state and Anna Wolfenden, who's the new priest up at St. John's, wrote a grant last fall in hopes of getting a program started here in Northampton. She's waiting to hear and um, we are one of the congregations that is on that grant as being willing to help with that effort should it should it come to pass. So Booker and I will renew our pledge commitment this month. We have talked about raising it by $1,000. And we will do that because we feel responsible and grateful and because we can. We do it in the name of love. So thank you all. Thank you for your financial gifts and commitments. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for trusting us with your children. And thank you for what Leslie Takahashi calls your infinite acts of service, large and small, that make the parts here so much greater than the whole. Please now rise in body or spirit and join in singing hymn number one, May Nothing Evil Cross This Door.
come from another minister named John Morgan. In the end, it won't matter what we have, but how generously we have given. It won't matter what we know, but how well we have lived. And it won't matter what we believe, but how deeply we have loved. Go in hope and in peace.